Hello, and welcome to the second Ukrainian support convening on accessing subsidies. This is the first session on accessing subsidies. This is specifically designed for County Department of Social Services staff. So if that is not you, we kindly ask that you would go ahead and hop off. This is specifically designed for uh, California Department of Social Services staff. We will have future sessions, uh, such as those that you see listed here on this slide regarding accessing subsidies, like rent, utilities, things like that, supports for UHPs and sponsors. Following that session, we will have one on September 14th regarding cons cultural considerations for direct service staff, educators, and anyone uh, working with Ukrainian humanitarian parolees. And a reminder that we host these convenings the second and fourth Thursday through mid-November at 10 a.m. Couple session reminders. Please note that everyone has been placed on mute and that will remain that way through the, the session. Please use the question and answer box to type in your questions and upvote questions that uh, are similar to the ones that you would ask. Finally, at the end of each section, we will have a live question and answer section with the individuals who presented that material. At the very end of the session, we will also ask you to complete a survey um, where you can add anything that you think would help make these sessions better. Today's session will be on documentation and extensions as presented by SAI from USCIS. And then following that, we'll have eligibility and common scenarios, reports and escalations, and where to find central resources presented by Veronica from RPB and Octavio from CalWorks. I am one of the community relations specialists for our agency. Uh, for those folks who don't know, we have one, two, three, four, five in the state of California. Um, so if you are not connected with your local uh, community relations specialist, please let me know and I can get you connected. Um, I know that my email address wasn't included um, in the slide, but I will be um, adding that in the chat box so you guys do have that contact information. Okay, go ahead and next slide, please. All right, so. Just a brief overview of some of the different documentation that we provide for this specific population. Um, there's basically two types of I-94 documents that you may see as folks appear in your offices. Um, so the first one on the left is the electronic I-94. This is the document that folks will have to go into the CBP system, so Customs Border Protection, and download this document. Um, one of the great features of this new system is that if they lose this I-94, they can just go back into the system and re-download it. Um, back in the day, if someone would issue the uh, little white card, which is the one on the right-hand side, and they need to replace that document, they'd have to pay to get a new um, paper uh, I-94. But basically, um, you know, both versions have the basic information. It will include their admission number. Um, so that's very important, especially if you're trying to run a save report. Of uh, the date they're admitted until. Okay, so everybody who was issued an I 94, basically they're not a green card holder, they're not a US citizen, so they have a specific time period where they're allowed to be in the United States. Okay, so that applies to all parolees, refugees, asylees, um, you know, and again, the date and the abbreviations will vary depending on their category. It will have their, you know, their name, their birth date their passport number, if they have one. Sometimes folks don't have a passport number. And so when that doesn't um, exist, we would actually use the A number or the USCIS number in, in lieu of that. And of course, um, the, the country of, of issuance of the, of the passport, the date they entered and their class of admission. Okay, so the class of admission is very, very important because that will tell you exactly what is this person's status um, and again, I know parolees is a very hot topic and very confusing for you guys, but for the UHU, you know, uh, population, they could have basically three types. Okay, it could be the DT, which is kind of a catch-all parolee, you know, status, uh, PAR, which stands for parolee, and also UHP. 
Um, so, you know, if folks have any of these three variations and they're from the Ukraine, there's a good, good chance, you know, they are under the U4U program. So again, these are the sample I-94s that you should be encountering in your offices. Next slide, please. Now, as far as employment authorization document, so all parolees, okay, if they want to work in the United States, they do have to apply for this document. Um, you for you and OAW, which is the Afghan parolees, I believe the, the fee is waived for, for these folks, for at least for the initial one. Um, they basically have two options to apply. They can apply online, okay? And to do this, they will have to create what we call the My USCIS account. This is probably the most efficient way to apply for the EAD. But if folks aren't comfortable with the internet or using a computer, they can still paper file. Um, it's a slower process. They have to mail everything in. If it gets rejected for whatever reason, you know, they could lose up to, you know, four to six weeks, you know, to, to fix the issue of why it was rejected. Um, once the form is accepted, basically the next steps in documents they receive is, is basically section two, okay? So there's a various 797 documents. So the first one will be a receipt notice. Now, if a person applies online, they'll get that automatic notice, you know, immediately sent to their email or, the, or through their account. So they'll see that immediately. Um, if they paper file, we will mail it to them, okay? Um, once they receive the receipt notice, the next step is being scheduled for a biometrics appointment. So this is basically capturing their fingerprint, uh, um, their signature, their right index finger for the document. Um, we schedule these appointments, um, so the folks just kind of have to wait to see when we'll, they'll get scheduled. Um, once they get scheduled and the um, 765 is approved, okay, they'll get an approval notice, okay? Um, and just basically list same basic information. I'll have, you know, their USCIS number, their receipt number, and, you know, how long they were approved for. And then the actual work permit or EAD is um, issued on what we call form I-766. So if you go to the next slide, you can see those examples. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the 797s. Um, so this basically covers all the various types of 797s that you may come in contact. So again, for the uh, you for you folks, you will mostly likely see the 797, the 797C, and the 797D. Okay, so the 797 is a basically a communication of receipt. Okay, so once again, once they submit the 765 application, they'll get this notice saying we received it, um, and then once it's been approved, okay, they will also get another 797. Um, if we have to, um, I don't know, request additional evidence, um, they may get a 797E, uh, okay? So maybe there was missing, I don't know, birth certificate or maybe missing passport information, we may request that as well. And once it's actually been approved and the 797D will be issued with the actual uh, 767 document, which is the actual work permit card. Next slide, please. All right, so this is the actual work permits. So we basically have two um, versions. We released a 2023 version, which is the one on the um, left-hand side. Um, so you might not be seeing these right away because generally we try to go through all of our stock of the previous version, which is the 2017 version. So you'll see both, okay? And again, I'll have the same basic information. I'll have their picture, their name, their USCIS number or their A number, their category, the card number is also their receipt number, in okay? case so anybody who submits an application with us is always issued a receipt number. Their date of birth, their sex, their country of birth, and how long uh, the work permit is valid for. So for the most part, you for you should be getting um, a two-year work permit, okay, an EAD. Um, and, and this is, again, for the ones who are actually granted under the U4U you program. And the ones who came in before U4U for you for, uh, was established um, they should be getting instead a 797 extension letter extending their current um, EAD. Um, but the category is also very important. This basically tells you, you know, what is this person here for in the United States and what they're in the process for. So um, all parolees, whether it's you for you, Afghan, uh, Haitians, Cubans, you know, whatever, they all will receive the C11 category. So this tells me this person is here in the United States as a parolee. Next slide, please. Now, there were a, a group of folks who entered the United States through their border before you for you were established, and they were actually um, paroled into the United States for a period of one year. So these uh, Ukrainians who were paroled between February 24th 
of 2022 and April 25th of 2022, okay, only got one year versus the two year under you for you. Okay. And so um, if, if this, you know, if this population needs to get that extension, okay, uh, we'll basically talk about that in the next slide. But one of the most important things that we want you for you folks, whether they got the one year or the two year, is they need to update their address with us, okay? And to do that is to file the um, AR11 on our website, because we will send notices, whether it's the automatic extension, the work, whatever, through the mail to their current address. And it is required by law, okay? So if you're not a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, you're required by law to do this within 10 days of moving. So that's very important to also stress to these clients when they come into your offices. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, for those folks who were paroled um, at the border before you for you've established, um, to, to get that one-year extension, what they can do is actually go to the CBP website and see if CBP has granted the extension. Okay, so that's the very first step. We can't give them the extended EAD until CBP extends their parolee status. And to find out if that happened, they have to visit that website and re-download their um, I-94 to see if they got that extension. Um, once that extension happens by CBP, they notify USCIS, and then we will then issue a 797 extending the work permit. So what that means is they'll have a one-year work permit and this uh, um, extension letter that will go together and they can use it for an additional year to work, um, to go to DMV, to go to social security, to visit the county agencies. So that's what they'll receive. Um, if they want to get an actual EAD um, you know, card with the, the two-year extension, then they will have to apply for one. Um, but you know, the 797 and the one-year EAD should be enough for whomever needs to see it. <clears throat> and again, very important to update our um, their address with us as soon as possible. Now, if a person still has not gotten that um, one-year extension from CBP, um, I think April was the deadline, they need to reach out to CBP to find out what happened, okay? Was, was the case missed by accident? Um, you know, whatever. They need to find out from CBP because, again, we can't extend the work permit until they get that parolee extension from CBP. Next slide. Um, so I don't work for SAVE. <laughs> uh, we work with SAVE, but I don't work for SAVE. So SAVE is a separate division within USCIS. Um, and so I know we had a lot of SAVE questions that were submitted previously. And so I, what I do encourage you guys to do, if you haven't already, is go to the SAVE website. Um, they have information on how to read SAVE responses, uh, sample common immigration documents, and also SAVE FAQs. Um, if you're a registered SAVE um, county agency, then you should also be signed up for their automatic emails. So anytime they send up updates and changes, you should get those automatically. Um, another way to get those updates is to um, sign up through um, the non-SAVE website, which is the USCIS public website. You can get those updates as well. But again, we do encourage folks to go to SAVE website. Um, you know, they also have, um, next slide, please. They also have webinars, okay? So I do a training that focuses on immigration documents and the major immigration programs, but SAVE will do training on the SAVE system, how to use it, how to read responses, how to find information, how to follow through with additional questions if you have any. So please, please, I do encourage you guys to go to the SAVE website. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop here and see if we have any questions. Thank you, Sai. We do have one that has come up, and the question uh, is, will the I-94 COD be different from the EAD category? Yes. So I-94 category and the EAD category are two separate codes. They have no, um, they're not going to be the same. They're, they're related in what, you know, um, you know, UHP I-94 code basically says this person's a Ukrainian parolee which allows them to get the C11 EAD category. So um, they are different. So EAD categories have their own separate you know, codes as well as I-94 categories, but they are related in that, in that way. Hopefully that answered that question. A couple more questions have come in here. Um, one regarding Ukrainians who were paroled for one year at the Mexican border last year, most of them have had their parole extended, right? So we've discussed that. However, 
Some of them, especially with minor children that were included in their parents' passport, do not show that their parole has been extended. And for some, the I-94 website says no record found. Customers have attempted to reach out to both CBP through their website as well as USCIS, but were unable to resolve their issue. This is affecting getting EAD extensions as well as obtaining a driver's license for those folks. Um, who can we reach out to to escalate some of those individual scenarios? So I just want to confirm when they say they reached out to CBP website, did they reach out to deferred inspections? Um, so deferred inspections is basically um, at each international port of entry. And so their main purpose is to provide assistance with I-94 issues. Um, and they do have, you know, specific emails and phone numbers and addresses for deferred inspections. And I don't think we have that included on our um, contact sheet, Hannah. So I can I can include that as well in, in the chat box. But yeah, anybody who has any issues with their I-94, whether it's a misspelling of a name, um, birth date, it doesn't exist when they try to pull up the record, deferred inspections is who they should be reaching out to for that information. And so I'll, I'll see if I can pull that up and put it in the chat box as well. Thank but you. yeah, a USCIS, we can't do much because it's a CBP system and a CBP function. So we can't change anything. We can't do anything um, other than tell you guys that deferred inspections, um, CBP is where you should be reaching out to. Thank you. And can you please explain the VWR class of admission? VWR? I am not familiar with that, that code. I'm gonna to have to go back and look that one up. I have to get back to you on that one. Um, I know we have a VWW, which is Visa Waiver Program, um, which is basically for those individuals who are from certain countries where we have a reciprocal relationship where their citizens can come here without having to get a visa from us first. So as long as they stay 90 days or less. Um, so I don't know if that is the class admission code they're referring to. So we're gonna to have to um, pin that one, Hannah, and, and I'll do some research on that because I'm not familiar with that, that code of mission. Thank you. Um, another question is, how does someone go about obtaining a fee waiver? So the initial work permit is fee exempt. So they shouldn't have to include the fee waiver when they file the work permit. But just generally speaking, if you're applying for a different immigration benefit and, it, and the, the fee waiver applies, um, form I-912 is the fee waiver application, which you can get from our website, okay, form I-912. Um, there is supporting documentation that, that needs to be provided. So if a person is receiving a means-tested benefit like um, SSI, uh, food stamps, Medi-Cal, they may be eligible for that fee waiver. But again, not every single benefit is eligible. Um, so you'd have to double check on the fee waiver form to find out you know, what, what benefit is eligible for that. Thank you. And do all 94 COD DT holders have an EAD form or card? They have to apply. So it's not an automatic. Okay. So once they've been paroled under the DT program, and if they want to work, then they have to apply with the 765 application. And then once they're approved, they'll get that work permit, the EAD. Um, but yes, so it's not automatic. They still have to apply to get it. So that's important. That's a step they need to do on their own. Is the USCIS number on the EAD card the same as the A number? How yes. about the I-94 electronic R-94 card? Is the A number reflected? So the first answer is yes. So USCIS number and A number is the same thing. I don't know why they changed it on these cards and documents because it's very confusing. So yes, if somebody asks for the A number when you're doing a save run or, or a query, um, it's the same as the USCIS number. Um, as far as the I-94 document, it's not. It's generally is not included. Um, so the only time you would see the A number on the I-94 is if the person does not have a passport. So that, that line has to be filled with something. And so CBP will just put the A number there um, if they have one. So, but usually it, it doesn't exist on the I-94. So if they have a passport and they were paroled in, they'll just have the I-94 number and their passport number and that's it. And then when they apply for um, the work permit, 
that's when you'll you'll see the uh, the A number or the USCIS number. Veronica, I see that you have your hand raised. Yeah, sorry, I don't mean to to bump the the chat questions, but I wanted to ask you, Sai, um, when you refer to the DT code, that's a that's a a real touchy code um, with regards to a lot of the county workers knowing what that means. So when you say DT code, you're speaking, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're speaking of parole ease in general, mm -hmm. not necessarily those that are under 212D5? No, all, all DT, all PARs, UHU, Afghan parolees, all parolees are, are um, admitted under 212D5, all of them. So 212D5 is the actual section of law that gives us the authority to parole these people. And I know this is very confusing for county agencies because, um, you know, I think the, the county and the state regu regs basically says anybody who was paroled under 212D5 is eligible for certain benefits, right? I think that's what it says. And to change that, I, I made a suggestion. I think that needs to be changed and updated because it, it's difficult because somebody can be a DT parolee under 212D5 to attend removal proceedings. Right. right? And you and you can't really see that on that I-94. And so that's why, um, you know, you have to kind of break it down to the actual code if, if it are possible. If it's just DT, it really is important for the county worker to investigate and ask additional questions. What was your purpose? Why did you come here? Were you here to attend a funeral? Were you here to get medical assistance? You know, were you here to, you know, be removed? You know, so that's that's what's very important that, you know, there are additional questions involved to find exactly what is the purpose of a DT because DT is a catch-all. It covers multiple types of, of scenarios and situations and in, in, in um countries, I guess. So um yeah, so it's very important. And 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 again, again, I would suggest if there's a way to change your guys' regulations to kind of break it down to specific codes of emissions versus just DT, I'm sure that would make the lives of the county workers <laughs> a little bit easier and helpful. <laughs> yeah, we're we're working on that. Um but just so to be clear with with the Ukrainian humanitarian parolees, if it says DT, we know it's 212D5. Mm -hmm. But we also have to be sure that they're that they have been admitted through the program or that they are part of you for you or they're part of that category of people prior to mm -hmm. you for you from uh, February until April. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And si, I know you okay, only have a few more moments here, so I want to pass to Octavio, our uh, presenter from CalWorks. And can, can I just ask one question, Sai? Uh, so are you, your suggestion is the county staff should be asking questions about why you came here, how do you get this? Is that what your suggestion is? The county staff should be asking those questions to the client with the DT code? Or yes. that is, or that or that is a UCIS function. I, I don't think the county will be asking why you come here to the United States. Yeah, is I don't know if the state report will break it down to to why the person is here. Um, that I would have to reach out to Save to find out. Okay, but I, I, I don't. Think, I I don't think that is the function of the state of the county staff. Asking the clients immigration questions, why you come here, why you have the DG code, uh, I think we need to figure out some other way. The county function is only if they have the valid, just to determine the eligibility based on the documentation they have, but not asking about the questions about why they came here, uh, how did they get here, all those questions. I think that is a UCIS saying Homeland Security questions, I guess. And, and 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 you're right. We should be providing additional clarification for these DT codes. But I'm just going to say that sometimes you may get a response that says DT parolee, um, and then this person's before your county applying for benefits, but they're being set up for removal proceedings. So if that's if that's you know allowed, right? If, if that's if that's a benefit they're eligible for with the county, then yes, that's that's great. Then you guys can move forward. But if it's not, then you know just letting you know that. You may have to follow up with SAVE for additional verification and information on the DT code, because again, DT covers a variety of scenarios and situations. 
So just look, putting that out there. Thank you. So my name is Octavio Galvano with the CDSS Coward Program. And this has the specific this this question around DT or this conversation around DT has been ongoing. And you know, there's been some confusion among our county partners about whether or not they're eligible for state or federal funded TANF or CALPS benefits. Mm -hmm. Essentially, based on conversations that we had with UCIS, we've been telling our county partners that um, they cannot solely rely on the DT code and they would have to ask additional quite or they would have to request additional verifications. And if they the individual cannot provide additional verifications, then they would have to rely on the safe report and all available information. We also give them instructions that you know there is a form, I believe it's I forgot the form. G something that they can submit to the USES to get verification. But essentially, we've been asked to provide guidance on this officially. Um, so we are drafting um, a policy letter. And well, we're going to be working with Veronica and our partners, refugees. But I'm wondering, and please feel free to say no or if you want to get back to us, but would this would it be helpful for USCIS to take a look at the policy before we release it? Or would that not be beneficial? Um, I, I don't see why not. We could definitely take a look at it. And, and again, this is this is, like you said, this is an ongoing issue. I know for for the state and the county agencies, and um, this is something that I will definitely bring up to say and saying, you know, we need to be more detailed maybe in our responses for these DT codes, mm -hmm. um, if at all possible, to help you guys out. Um, and I don't know if that's an option or not. I mean, I don't. Again, I I don't know say very well in terms of the system and what it allows them to, to include and not include. Um, but yeah, that that is something we can definitely bring up to save. And and yes, I mean, I, mean, I don't know what we could do with the document, but yeah, taking a look at it, I'm, you know, I don't, it won't hurt. <laughs> so I yes, to that. share. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll, I'll coordinate with our partners and refugees. Sorry, we have one more. Uh, we have several more questions here. So folks, thanks for putting those in the Q&A chat. We will follow up on this and release more information after the session. So keep populating the Q&A chat. Um, one last question here is, can you share what the PAR class of admission is? Uh, the individual's unable to locate that on the USCIS site. PAR, so P-A-R. Um, so it's basically a parolee. So that's another, um, sorry, I'm, I'm adding my email address before I have to jump off for another meeting. Oh, that's good. So let me get that, make sure you guys have that. Um, so yeah, it's another another code of admission for, for parolee. Um, DT is where the district office at that port of entry made that determination as person's parolee. PIR, I believe, is maybe they applied for the benefit in advance and then was approved. Um, and then, of course, you have all the other different code of missions for that specific program. So like UHP is for Ukrainians, um, OAW, OAR is for Afghans. Um, but yeah, it's it's just another parolee category. And um, I can definitely, and uh, Hannah, I'm hoping you're writing these questions down or recording this. I am, I can yes. Pinpoint them to the uh, location for the parolee code of mission. Um, it's on a, an actual document. Um, I don't know if it's on our website. But I know we have the actual document of all the coded admissions since 1960s, I want to say, um, that I can share with you guys. Final question here, and I know you do need to hop off after this. Does the DHS uh, plan to announce a TPS re-registration period for Ukrainians soon? I don't know. Um, I know that um, you know parole status is not a is, a is not a permanent status, and folks should be looking for different avenues um, to secure their status permanently if they want to stay here in the United States. But um, I, I'm not sure. I haven't heard um, of whether or not we'll be doing an extension for uh, TPS for Ukraine. And if we do, um, it will be on our website, <laughs> and we'll make announcements. Um, so if you're signed up for the automatic eGov delivery messages from our website, you'll get those automatically once we make the announcement. All right. So I thank you so much. I know you had a hard stop and you've already gone over and given us more of your time. So I appreciate you. We will continue to collect questions and bring those to you later. Uh, we will email everyone who has been on this uh, or is a government entity staff registered with these sessions, this information. Um, and everybody, please know you can use the Q&A chat window here on the survey. There's an additional chance to ask questions that were not resolved that we will continue to follow up on. So Sai, thank you for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Welcome. And we will, hey, everyone. Thank you. We will transition now to...
Oh, I was all the way at the top there. We will transition now to uh, our chats with pr regarding program eligibility and common scenarios with Veronica and Octavio. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, we've had several questions from county staff, managers, supervisors, and the like uh, that these questions represent. So we appreciate you being here and let's hop in. Again, uh, everyone, there will be time for live Q&A at the end. Feel free to put questions in the question and answer section. Uh, just FYI, Hannah Octavio had to hop off sure. for a little bit because he's got other meetings, but um, hopefully he'll be back. But we'll do our best to, I will do my best to answer what I can. We always do. I appreciate you, Veronica. Thank you. Well, let's, let's hop in here. Um, some of the things that are going to be answered are kind of what documents are required to enroll in benefits. When would someone not have a security number uh, at intake? Why would they have a non-work number? Uh, what if a, a case has been delayed? What happens if they've passed one year on parole? And if I can't get what I need, where should I go? So let's get started. Veronica, uh, you know, one of the questions that came up was regarding what if uh, a UHP does not have a social security number at the point of intake? And we developed this chart uh, just as a quick visual to demonstrate what document type is needed across which program. But I was wondering if you could share a little bit more um, about RCA. Sure. Um, RCA does not require a social security number. Um, it is not part of the, the application process. However, it is for uh, CalWORKS and CalFresh, um, other programs. So we realize that that's, while it, you know, it's not necessary for our program, it will be to get your food stamps, your um, Medi-Cal things such as that. So um, they must apply for their social security number um, based on the need and the requirement of it for those programs. Um, because social security does in fact know which that there are programs that require it and that's one of their the basis for why they would give a social security card. So even though even though regardless that we don't we don't request it, it is definitely something that that needs to be done and, and should be done by by those who are intending to work especially and to get these programs. Thank you. We see a few other of the programs here, CalWORKS, CalFresh, and WIC with their corresponding document types and some examples as well. If you have questions about those, please put those in the chat. This next question uh, comes from a staff asking, when would a UHP be assigned a non-work authorized social security number? Uh, this question, the response to this question was gained from the Social Security Administration through collaboration across RPB and other departments. Um, and this is a text heavy slide. You will be receiving this slide after the session. Veronica, is there anything else that you'd like to say about this specific uh, why a UHP might be assigned a non-work authorized number? The only other thing I can think of um, beyond what this answer provides is that sometimes the SSA offices do behave in different ways. Um, there are times, of course, where there's going to be um, perhaps lack of training of staff, just like there is in all our agencies where information takes time to, to get across. Um, and in those cases, I know as a previous eligibility worker, um, you may need to assist those clients in obtaining the social security number, um, especially with RCA clients that is part of the, the program regulations is that we are to assist them as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> but technically, <clears throat> excuse me, unless there's some reason that USCIS or CBP determined that they um, are not to have not to be employable or not allowed to work. Um, I, I don't know of a reason why they would be given a non-work author authorized social security number. There are groups, but in terms of Ukrainians, um, they generally are all given the employment authorization and therefore are eligible for social security number with to, to work. Thank you. 
What should uh, an eligibility worker tell a UHP if their case has been delayed? So they've come in, they're frustrated, there's not a, there's not a resolve yet. Uh, what should happen? You know, this has come up quite often. Um, you know, we we do receive uh, emails and calls from from community members that are saying, you know, we've walked into the to the welfare office and it's been a week and we haven't heard anything, or we're waiting on our appointments and we haven't got our appointment. The county does have 30 days to complete the application. Um, so while we absolutely understand that somebody coming in and, and they don't have money, food stamp, you know, ability to, to buy themselves food or things like that, um, there is that waiting process. If they feel like they have nothing, their sponsors unable to support them in any way, they can request emergency assistance. Um, I do know there's some uh, difficulties in terms of CalSAS um, having certain immediate need options. However, I, as a county worker, I believe you have the discretion to to get that information from a client and their and their SAS form, their application, and see that th this person is is in it is in immediate need or is in an emergency crisis situation where they have no money, no food, and hopefully we can expedite those applications if possible. Um, so obviously, if if uh, someone that comes in and applies feels that th this is an emergency, um, and if you if you encounter somebody that comes in and they have a lot of times it's going to be their um, perhaps a, a representative from a nonprofit, um, they they're going to be insistent about this. Um, and I would say for the betterment of this parolee, we just have to try to to do the best we can to get the, the application done quickly. Um, and so, you know, we've we have told people that are going in, especially if it's after the 30 days, to escalate to a supervisor to ask for um, attention to that application. And, and if there's any, go ahead. I also want to add that um, a, a cultural component here is that in Ukraine, most systems, uh, one, are digitized and two, operate very quickly. Uh, a vignette of this would be, you know, if someone, a Ukrainian in Ukraine uh, prior to what's happening currently were to go into, let's say, a bank, uh, apply for, you know, a credit card or something like that, they would walk out of the bank with the card. Um, they're not needing to wait another week for the bank to mail it and things like that. So it's also really important to help set expectations on your first few interactions that the United States does have many um, processes. Bureaucracy here is is not bad. It looks different. And it could mean that we need to help adjust that um, time expectation because the norm for Ukrainians uh, is very different than the norm of processing times here in the United States. So uh, not just the technical advice there, but also as we're working with folks, really making sure that we're uh, understanding or aware of some of the pieces of where they're coming from. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. And I want to note here, Abdi um, noted in the chat that it is 30 days for RCA. What should I do if a UHP passes one year on parole? Uh, this question was covered slightly, uh, was covered in size section, um, but want to give a chance here, Veronica, for you to explain, yes, we know now what DHS is doing, uh, but what, what should the worker do who's interacting with that UHP um, ideally, it's running the save. Um, and it could be that, I guess, there are instances where there is no information and or maybe it hasn't been processed um, because they are going on a case by case basis. Um, you know, we're we're asking for the cases to remain active um, while this is happening. And this really boils down to communication with the client if they've indicated that they're you know, they, or, or if we know that they're in that time period between the February 24th to April 25th, this is coming. Um, and just running the save report to see when it has been updated. And of course, it falls upon the UHP themselves to, to contact 
uh, save or contact CBP or contact USCIS to find out the status of their case. Um, but that's pretty much all we can do because we're not in control of the extensions at this point um, is just keep checking on the status. But we ask that those cases not be terminated. Um, and, you know, that that's been the direction we've been given or we've been giving to counties. Well, also, if you, everyone will be receiving follow-up resources in an email, and we will include the links that you can provide to UHPs uh, to take the steps that we're asking, that you're asking them to take. So not only can you say, hey, you know, this is what the next step is, but provide them immediately what is actionable for them to take that as well. All right. Uh, Hannah, this is a Let me just also add, uh, what we were told by OR and UCIS is this. All Ukrainians who have a less than one year parole status automatically will be, uh, their I-94 automatically will be updated. So I think my suggestion will be to ask the client to uh, see if their I-94 is automatically updated or not. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the information we're receiving is for those clients that do not have automatically extended for their parolee, if they see that, then they need to connect with that client and ask him to connect with the UCIS. Based on the information we have, all Ukrainians who arrive in the United States and have less than one year parolee on their passport or whatever their documentation they have, they all have been automatically, they don't have to apply, automatically have been updated their status to extend that, that program. That is the direction we are receiving. For that reason, I myself even asked the uh, UCSOR if they can provide us any more guidance on this. The answer was no. They are not going to be providing any guidance because they don't need to. Uh, so for that reason, the, the recommendation for the county staff who are here is if you encounter a client who parole status expired, who have originally one year and expired, please let the client know to check online and clients can check online their I-94 to see that extension have been extended and then ask them to provide that new extension. Uh, and what we're, told, what we're told is everybody, everybody, I am talking about all the Ukrainians, their I-94 has been extended for uh, those who have less than a year. Yeah, that's the information and affirming that, uh, Abdi. And, and for those who maybe haven't, uh, for, for some reason, ha seen that extension, uh, as Sai mentioned, instructing folks to go to the CBP website and then make sure they're specifically adding this topic, I-94 traveler compliance, the subtopic Ukrainians paroled, uh, and that will indicate to uh, USCIS that it, and, and other agencies that uh, follow-up is needed, because like Abdi said, that it should be extended. So thank you, Abdi. All right. Um, Isabel, I see you have a raised hand, a uh, pertinent comment on this slide. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that we've had a lot of success finding updated information on the I-94. Definitely recommend it. Um, it has been a lifesaver. So it's, it's, just wanted to point that out. Thank, Thank you, Isabel. Mm -hmm. And I'll post that link again in the chat. Um, it'll be included in the slide deck uh, and resources that are sent out as well. Thank you. All right, Veronica, who should I contact if I can't get yeah. one? <laughs> <laughs> well, when it, when it comes to data from CalSAS, um, CalSAS contracts directly with the counties. Um, we ourselves, actually don't even have access to CalSAS at this point. 
um, what the best avenue is to contact your CalSAS regional representative. Um, CWDA is actually the ones that are, I guess, oversee that and have the list of regional representatives. Um, so it would be a matter of asking a supervisor, you know, inquiring who that is and then making a request at your county to, to pull data. But we unfortunately don't have access to CalSAWS. And when when I spoke with CalSAWS and CWDA, it, it's really a matter of reaching out to them. Thank you. As I have a slide here with contact information, this will be provided uh, with the slide deck and all of the information from today, but these are the quick information, the places to go and the best point to start escalation um, for the policy team, for specific save questions, and then some things that in order for your request to be successful the first time to include, as well as those key dates. So making sure that depending on what the uh, question is regarding, that the right number of days have has passed for that to, especially with SAFE, uh, to have been active. Finally, there's two slides here before we go into a live Q&A section is I wanna let you know that we have prepared what we're calling a, a bridge resource. It is in Google Sheets, it is view only. It will have an updated uh, frequently asked questions and support resources. So those questions that are coming in, uh, we're going to put those answers in here, as well as some helpful links. And so over here, you see there's some specific places where policy letters are, and that's a info, and it's specifically best for government staff. But we're also going to go ahead and include what is beneficial to service providers, everyone. And since you're directly engaging with sponsors and UHPs, that that would be available to you as well. Some are going to be county specific, and you'll be able to filter by that. That is a bridge resource until we have a new resource hub uh, launch, which should be coming uh, later this summer, early fall. I wanted to let you know again that that will be searchable by service and location. It will be updated regularly. Um, we'll provide more information on that as it becomes available. In the meantime, we also have that uh, Google map created for services specifically to UHPs uh, in various areas, depending, you can filter down by the service needs. So if it's childcare, if it's employment services, things like that are available. Again, this link will be provided in the follow-up email. Now we have some questions uh, coming in. First, uh, Veronica Fabio, thank you for being here to field these. And the first one is, if we grant RCA because they were not eligible for CalWORKs due to no social security number, proof of social security app, or no eligible children, and they later become CalWORKs eligible, for example, three months later, they become pregnant, do we treat it as an intra-program transfer and switch them to CalWORKs, or do they need to submit a new SALS-1 application? Um, I think Octavio's back, but yeah, yeah. my understanding would be that it, they would not need to reapply. Is that correct, Octavio? Uh, actually, because RCA is a separate program for CalWORKs, we're going to take this back, but right now my initial, um, my initial response is that more than likely a new application would be required for CalWORKs because they would have to evaluate the circumstances. They would have to request um, if there's any income that needs to be considered, that has to be taken into calculation. But I'm gonna take this back just to confirm. And I'll probably have a conversation with counties as well about county practices. And actually I do see Isabel who has been working with us um, and this population. And we've been having some really great discussions around Ukrainian humanitarian parolees and RCA and Calif's eligibility. So, Isabel, are you able to share the county practice? Yes. In this situation? <laughs> yes. Thanks, Octavio. So, basically, what we do in Sacramento, um, and it was, it was because of research that we've done, is we do take a new application. And the, the reason for that is because in the CalWORKs program, we need to determine uh, deprivation for the child. 
So at the point that a child, you know, becomes part of the family, we want to see if the child has deprivation and meet the coward's regulations that way. So the way um, it used to happen um, most commonly before pregnant women were not able to get aid until their second trimester, I want to say. But now that the regulations have changed for CalWORKs, typically a pregnant applicant will just go ahead and put them in CalWORKs from the beginning. But to answer your question, we do have them go through an application um, process, and we also give them a different um, case number. And sometimes we've had situations because in the CalWORKs program, if you have a pregnant person only and a second parent, the second parent cannot be active on the CalWORKs case. So we'll put one parent on RCA, the, the, the pregnant person will put them on a different case number. So um, we just like transfer that person over. So it, it's just, um, that's the way we normally do it. Thank you so much for confirming. Welcome. That. And also just to, I guess, to emphasize that if there were any verifications that were provided for RCA and they're still available, then the county will use those verifications in order to, you know, make the transition a little bit more um, easier for the, the CalWORKs applicants. Right, I agree. Yes, any documentation, the worker really should be going into the RCA case file and grabbing it from there. And we and we should also be doing that. And that's what we tell our staff is when we have families and then they have young adults that go on RCA, sometimes we find the original paperwork with the parents' case. So anytime the information is available to the county, we should be going in there and looking for it. Thank you for the collaboration there, everyone. We really appreciate it. Another question um, is the child support questionnaire required for RCA cases if there are children and an absent parent or unmarried parent? Did you guys want me to answer that? Yeah. Um... Well, you yeah, know, for I'd RCA, love hear, I'd love to hear the practice. I know that the child well, support questionnaire is, is a touchy subject. Go ahead, Isabel. Well, well, it was kind of for the same reason I just explained right now. So deprivation is not a requirement for the RCA program. So that's the reason why we did have a different intake in CalWORKs. So it is for CalWORKs. They are required to cooperate with child support. Uh, of course, there's exceptions. Right. If they're married um, in tech families, if there's not uh, a marriage um, and this is like with any other coward's case, we would ask for information to establish paternity, that kind of deal. But it's kind of for the same reason why we do have separate uh, applications, because deprivation is not a factor in RCA. Thanks, Isabel. Welcome. Another question here um, is, at this time, and this might be um, for Abdi if you're uh, still available and on the line as well, um, at this time, UHPs that arrived prior to September 30th, 2023 are eligible to receive federal benefits per the ORR letter. Is there an expectation that this policy will be extended for those UHPs that arrived after that will arrive after that date? <laughs> Thanks, Anna. I'm laughing because this is a great question, and that's the question we've been asking all our our federal partners. Pretty much, we have every couple of weeks and every two weeks. Uh, so, uh, you know, Tavio and and Veronica and Hannah. This is the answer we are getting from our federal partners. At this moment, and we even asked even a couple of weeks ago, because time is running out, and I'm sure I think we're gonna have so many cases that will be affected by after September 30th. Uh, my understanding is, again, don't quote me, uh, this probably will be extended, Probably, but I am not 100% certain. They all are, and federal partners did not give us any negative yes or no. They, I think they are aware there are going to be a thousand, thousand cases 
throughout the United States who will be affected by this policy. At this moment, our this time as of today, we have not received anything that will tell us that extent it will be uh, uh, will be changed. However, you never know. Uh, I think all is aware. UCIS is aware. I think our federal partners are aware. Uh, but I think as of right now, no, we do not have any uh, indication or we have not received any guidance. Let me just put it this way. Uh, but we will keep asking them questions about this pretty much every week or every two weeks until we get something. But uh, no official written uh, guidance that we receive from our law. I, I want to add, um, Abdi, if I may, there in the eligibility information that we provided regarding the UHPs, and this is the principal UHPs, that end date is 9-30-23 as of now, um, but there's also those populations that are arriving after um, that are spouses, children, parents of the principal UHP. So you will be seeing people come in. Um, we haven't gotten any guidance at this point of what that is going to look like, whether it's going to be, it's going to say UHP. Um, and, and hopefully if we get some information, we can provide that to the county so that there's a little more clear definition of maybe what the COA is going to say, but I'm assuming it's going to be parole E as well. But you'll have to ask, perhaps ask the question, do you have a principal applicant that you came here to reunite with? And that is a whole other eligibility category that was included in the, the policy information that we provided. So little little nervous as we approach that date, what it's gonna kind of look like. Um, and as Abdi said, we're, we're trying to get as much information from ORR so we can prepare um, and relay that information to, to county workers. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate this discussion. And I know that there are additional questions lingering uh, please put those in the Q&A box or in the survey link. Um, I know that we are nearing time. So after this session, just a reminder, you're going to receive the full presentation, the referenced uh, save PDFs that you saw Sai mention, a link to those bridge resources, this Q&A list that we will continue to be updating as we receive more information and collaborate across uh, agencies and departments. And... Uh, we'll see you hopefully next uh, in two Thursdays on August 24th to discuss accessing subsidies. Uh, we appreciate you. Go ahead and fill out that survey link. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next in a couple of weeks. And, Take care, and, and, and Hannah, I think there's a question. Let me address that. Let me ask sure. that to that Thank question. You. I, th yes. I think there's a question uh, unique situation in San Diego County for RCA. Mm -hmm. So whoever asked that question, I I hope it's not the county staff. Uh, the county, yes, the county does provide RCA. All 58 counties in California, they do provide RCA. However, in San Diego, I think who asked that person is Dimitri in San Diego, uh, is very unique for couples or children with no children, meaning with no children under age of 18 who are not eligible for car wash. Catholic Charities of San Diego is the agency that provides the RCA. Families with children, usually, usually in San Diego County, they most likely maybe two or three months, and then they enroll them into the college. So to answer to that question, yes, the Health and Human Service Agency in San Diego County, they do provide RCA programs for families, but not for singles or couples with no children. I hope that answers your question, Dimitri. Thank you, Dimitri. And one of the things that we're doing, um, as, as Abdi has mentioned, is uh, providing resources specifically to UHPs. Uh, the resource hub will also be available in Ukrainian that will support individuals in accessing resources 
closest to them, uh, even if they move. So there'll be uh, information in San about San Diego, about Orange County, about LA, um, all of those areas, as well as information about service providers in Sacramento and other locations. So we look forward to releasing that um, as soon as it is developed. Abdi, also, thank you so much for hopping in. Uh, Octavio, Veronica, we really appreciate you. I know Sai has already left, um, but this has been a, a wonderful conversation. It's likely that we'll have um, another one in the fall and where we will invite uh, some CalSOLs and potentially save staff as well to come in and speak directly to government staff. So thank you and have a great day.